Hello, I hope everybody's having a great day. I'm your weekly host. Well, it's been a few weeks and I apologize. We've been a little bit busy here at the studio and it's summer. So I've been out gigging, traveling and doing what I love to do best, making songs and writing them and playing them for people. But today I have a very special guest who I've always looked up to for many, many reasons and I've never actually gotten to sit and have a conversation. So that's what today's Songwriter Sunday is all about. We're going to be sitting down with Mr. Eric Lambert, my very special guest. So everybody at home, give a big, big hoop. Uh, but uh, really excited to have have him is, uh, today at Region Buzz 219. And so um, here we are. We're doing it. This is this has been a, a long time coming for me, wanting to get you in on this show. And I'm very excited to have you. So thank you so much for being here. So very grateful for the ask. Thank uh, you. Absolutely. And uh, I just love how it came about. Walk <laughs> You know, so walking random. into a joint for uh, for some dinner, and and there you were playing. Mm -hmm. And I just looked across the table at Char and I said, "This cat's good." And then, of course, we met, and uh, yeah. and here we are. So, thank you so very much. Absolutely, yes, 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 absolutely. So, I know a bit about you just from you know reading up on you and seeing you play it being on the same lineup at different festivals and things like that. Um, but tell people who you are that may not know who you are, what you're trying to do, and what you're doing. Boy, oh boy, can I remember that far back. <laughs> well, Eric Lambert is my name, and uh, I'm a lifetime musician, continue to be. Um, about 20 years ago, I really began to focus on playing the acoustic guitar. Okay. After, uh, after being influenced by amazing guitar players by the name of Doc Watson, Tony Rice, Clarence White. You know, they played a, a flat pick, which uh, the style is called flat picking, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, uh, it's a style that that plays a lot of fiddle tunes and plays a lot of bluegrass and plays a lot of old time mountain music and, and Americana. And uh, you know, there's a lot of blues involved in that type of music. And I've really been focusing on that for the past, I w I've got, I don't know, I would say 20 years, but time flies sometimes. But maybe you know, maybe longer. I, <laughs> Maybe longer. I've played plenty of electric guitar, of course, mm -hmm. with uh, with Hartsfield and uh, Big Shoulders and those types of bands that first exposed me uh, to the road and and playing and traveling a lot and uh, and then after uh, you know once I took the leap and started playing bluegrass. I uh, I began to travel further and further, and that's when I got to see, you know, parts of Canada and Europe, and uh, even even bluegrass cruises, you know, to the Cayman mm -hmm. Islands. And stuff. Oh yeah, and it, it, it's just a, it's it's a style of music that really really speaks to me. It's got its own kind of soul. Mm -hmm. It's got its own kind of groove. You know, I grew up in Chicago. I mean, I learned about soul. I learned about groove. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my parents grew up in the North Carolina mountains. So there was something in my DNA that was waiting to hear oh, this yeah. stuff. You know, I and get it was, that. Uh, it was the Circle Be Unbroken album by the yeah. Nitty Gritty Dirt Band that, that got me. Okay. So cool. So now, at what what age did you like first pick up the guitar and start to sing? You wanted to write your own songs and that sort of thing. Well, I was playing guitar at thirteen years old. Thirteen. Okay, so we started around the same time then. I th I think that's probably a common. Yeah. Entry. Entry level. Level. Yeah. yeah. Did, were you pretty serious from the from the get go, or did you did it take you a little while? It took me a little while. I I mean I guess it took me a little while but I was I was as serious as I knew how to be 
That's a good way to put it. That's a very good way to put it, actually. Yeah, that's how I would describe myself. Yeah, I was as serious as I, th as, as I knew how to be, for sure. Okay. And, you know, there was still baseball and yeah. high school and, and mm -hmm. girls. And girls. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you get off the track mm -hmm. and you don't always play the guitar for there. the right reason. But it's but always But it's always there. there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like a. I tell people that guitar is like a festering virus. It, it you know, it, you try to, you try to like, you try to like get it out of your life as quickly as possible, and it somehow always just comes right back, you know. And and, and you're drawn to it. Music, you know, you don't choose music. Music chooses you. Absolutely. So. No one in the right mind, <laughs> you know, if you didn't love this. Yeah. You you wouldn't jump through the hoops that are necessary, nor would I, nor would no, nor would anybody, you know, any other serious player, because because it it, it does present some challenges mm -hmm. um, to live your life that way. Yeah, good and bad, and you know, you choose what you choose, and uh, and and you don't look back. So, at what point then were you starting out playing guitar? 13. Were you writing your own songs from then? No. So when did the songwriting come into play? Because that's something that I, I've always wanted to ask you. Well, I think I was trying to write things um, at least by the age of 16. Okay. All oh, right. heck yeah. You know, they were... They they were simple and they were plagiarized and you know <laughs> they were borrowed <laughs> and, then, and I was you know I was using what I had yeah you because you can only speak from the vocabulary that you've learned yeah which yeah. is which I think we we touched upon this off camera a little bit but as an instructor myself <clears throat> Eric's been been teaching much much longer than myself and I always tell my students like. Don't be afraid to listen to other music. Don't be afraid to play other music that you're not familiar with because you're going to learn something from it. Even if you learn that you hate something about it, you learn some kind of technique, something that's going to carry over into your your lane, so to speak. Absolutely. So. Oh, there's something to learn every day. Yeah. Um, you know, I hesitate to say every minute, but my gosh, if you if you're willing and your eyes and your ears are open, then it's it's truly unlimited musically uh, you know i just have these realizations after listening is listening to something perhaps and and something i've been listening to for 50 years and you hear something new yeah that's the, oh i love those moments. you hear something new and you're like are yep. you kidding you know and it had just never presented itself before mm -hmm. Live at Fillmore East, the Allman Brothers Band. <laughs> it continues to just... Give and give, huh? Give and give and give. That's awesome. So, now, you've done some different past projects and things, but what, what are you kind of like, what are you kind of doing right now? Like, what's the, like, the, the are you releasing, like, a new album post-pandemic? I know I've seen you, uh, shout out to John Carpenter over at Thunderclap. John is also oh, yeah. a producer of Caught on Klein as well. Um, great friend, just amazing engineer. He's been a huge mentor to me. I absolutely love John. So shout out to John. He's probably watching. Absolutely. And, shout uh, out I know to you've John. been recording there. So so tell me about some of those tunes and like what's the maybe the topics behind some of them. And well, uh, I'll play a tune today called "Beating the Odds." That'll be the name of the uh, recording that comes out August September. Um, I've worked with uh, Carrie Estrin out of Nashville, Tennessee for the past couple of years on my songwriting. You know, a few years back, several years back, time, time moves quickly, man. <laughs> you know, I got involved in an organization called Folk Alliance International. Okay. And... Uh, what I discovered there was that the uh, the members of this organization were primarily songwriters. And I started hearing songs that I had never heard before and that um, you probably don't hear on the radio, you know. 
just people from all over the world singing these songs. And I was like, oh my God, these are some of the greatest songs I've ever heard. And, you know, I, I like to say that I really have achieved a lot of my bucket list. That's beautiful. I've achieved a lot of that. And writing great songs, I thought, was something that I hadn't yet really put 100% of, of focus into. Because it was always the guitar. How do I get better on the guitar? And it's a hard balance to find. It's a hard balance to find. You know, because I'm I'm a I was a composer first. You know, that was what I first started doing was just com was just composition, no lyrics. And then I didn't even start singing until probably about seven eight years ago when I first started kind of breaking into the region scene. I always I had always written music, and I would write I would help write lyrics because I knew how. But I never thought I was capable of singing and playing my own things, like my own ideas. And then, and this is not a knock towards anybody that's probably watching that's been in bands, bands with me or nothing, but I got through that cycle of new lead singer, <laughs> new lead singer, new lead singer, new band, lead lead singer. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? Just do it your damn <laughs> self, you know? If Tom Waits and Dylan can write great tunes and sound not that great vocally to me, to my ears, I love their songwriting, but I am not a huge fan of their voices. And I said, I don't like the sound of my own voice. So I put myself in that mental space, so to speak, of just write the song and then eventually people will love the songs and you'll just get better at like feeling more comfortable about how you sound, you know? And so that's what it kind of, that's how it started for me. I was not, I was not a good singer. I still don't feel like I'm a good singer, but everybody says they, they know me as a singer now. And I'm like, wow, I'm like, that's so weird to me. <laughs> you know, that's so weird to me. All the years of wood shedding, you know, diatonic thirds and guitar nerdy stuff and, yeah 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 and and it just didn't it just never it never it never crossed my mind that i would be known as a singer ever but you know in the way that i look at it god allowed me to see those things through the experiences that i had and it helped me push through and the universe has allowed me to be able to do this for a living because i followed the leader where i was supposed to go Oh, you have to be as willing You get that instruction and you have to follow it. Yeah. You have yeah. to follow it. I've sang for a long time. Never considered myself a good singer or a great singer. But but I did learn early that if I can play the guitar and sing, then I can, at least back then, I could go work and I could get paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhere along the way of this songwriting process for the new record and uh and carrie was great for that because i would send her songs and she would critique them and she wasn't my friend <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't need to be nice to maintain our friendship she critiqued them like a pro the pro that she is and it really elevated my songwriting to the point where I feel now like I'm starting to write some songs that are of that level that I heard when I first started hanging out at Folk Alliance. And uh, of course, somewhere along that journey, it was suggested to me that I would benefit from paying more attention to my voice. So I did. So I hooked up with a wonderful, wonderful woman in Nashville named Susan Anders, who has helped me in that regard. So now I'm a pretty good player, and I'm a pretty good singer, and I'm a pretty good songwriter. Now you got to put it all together. <laughs> yeah, and that balance that you speak of is is really delicate. Super delicate, man. It's super delicate. Yeah. But um, as, as you pointed out, this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. And... Call it destiny, call it purpose, call it what you will. 
this is this is you know everybody walks some kind of path in life and i know that for myself speaking and probably i would say 90 percent of the musicians that i've talked to feel that same way you know there's no doubt about it i walked into a, a folk alliance regional down in Asheville, and uh i was determined to meet carrie estrin and for us to work together and I walked in the the first day, and the first day is all a meet and greet day, you know, and there was an open stage of, of newcomers and stuff. And I saw her at a table with four other mentors. It was a mentor <laughs> table, and I walked up there. <clears throat> and they they all had schedules laying in front of them where you would schedule fifteen minute mentor sessions. And hers was completely full. Except for one line. That was your line. That was my line. So I got my 15 minutes with Carrie. And and that's how my recent journey of learning how to write good songs began. And, of course, part of that journey included um, being professional just raising my game mm -hmm. at the suggestion of a professional, you know. And you lose sight of some things when you're just on the road a lot. Because at that point, a lot of your focus becomes, okay, you got five hours to sleep and we have to hit it. And a lot of the focus becomes just getting there. Yeah. Being on time. Being professional, of course. Being on time and and advancing the date mm -hmm. you know advancing the date yeah call before you go there you know yeah. these simple things that that aren't always obvious and uh, you lose sight of some things you lose sight of taking care of your voice you lose sight of warming up the guitar yeah. a lot learning something new learning something new becomes eating good food oh nearly impossible it's, it's nearly impossible yeah i've i've that's one thing i struggled with touring is i have crohn's disease so like i am very limited in what i can and cannot eat in the first place but being able to find something to eat while on the road is like you know sometimes pulling hairs because you're like well this has gluten well this has dairy yeah i can't have raw vegetables you know like everything's fried or <laughs> super high in cholesterol and you know, I try to, like, watch all that stuff. It's very difficult. Anyways, that was just a... Uh, it's not about me. It's about you. <laughs> well, you know, it's about us. I'm yeah. diabetic. Yeah. So you uh, I was. I've been on the road. Uh, I, don't, I don't know when I was diagnosed, but it was an adult diagnosis. So I've spent a lot of time in this business knowing that I was a diabetic. And uh, learning, <laughs> learning on a flight to Europe... That uh, that I didn't have to keep my uh, insulin on ice because the airline wouldn't provide me any. Oh. I mean, this is not a poor me story. This is a real story. Well, apparently there's some kind of li there's probably some liability somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. that they don't want to have. But I had asked the stewardess, I said, you know, could I have a glass of ice, you know, just something to. And uh, so anyway, that was a great learn. Like, oh, then I read a little bit further. And even though it's suggested, it's not like milk. It's not going to go bad. Yeah, okay. Anyway, that was, that was yeah. an interesting story and a good learn. But it is, it is difficult to, to eat. It's, it's been kind of nice in a lot of ways to be home for a year and exercise and mm -hmm. eat well and yeah. get sleep and and stuff like that and thankfully john our buddy john carpenter at thunderclap um was open-minded enough that we even worked a few times during during the summer that's great yeah i had i was able to send him some tracks that we had recorded here to mix and get things going um so he was still trying to do his best to like 
you know, appeal to still being able to work and give people the opportunity to have their voice heard. So a bit again, a big shout out to John Carpenter. Big shout out to John. Thunderclap, yeah, he's fantastic. He's uh, he's done wonders with this new recording, just just wonders. Yeah. And the uh, the recording project called Beating the Odds. Um, Feature songs that I've written, and of course my guitar playing and bass playing. I love to play bass. I love to play bass. <laughs> I don't know up? why. Stand up or I, I don't play stand. Up. Okay, okay. I'm I, I'm not I'm not that skilled. Okay. Yet to play. It's stand a whole up. different animal. It's, it's a different world. Yeah. And uh, the t- the few times I have tried, you know, sixty seconds in and those blisters. On your right hand, mm-hmm. and it's difficult to play another note. But uh, we had the uh, the great, great, great honor and, and good fortune of of uh, Don Sternberg coming down from uh, Skokie. Is it Skokie? He's up there in that burb area. The, yeah, the burbs, know. the western burbs. Yeah. Well, let's hear this first song. Let's see what let's see what this what you've been working on with John uh, over at Thundercloud. Let's see what this song's all about. All right, my friend. Thank you much. This is the title track. This is "Beating the Odds." Let's see. One, two, three. <laughs> When it feels like the whole world's against you And it's hard to get out of the bed You feel like your insides are empty And the voices, they scream in your head You drop to your knees, beg and say Please turn yourself over to the gods That's just the first step, you're well on your way to finally beat in the eyes Oh, that well of loneliness drown you You need to come up for some air The climb may be steep but There's help on the way It will pull you right out of despair You know you were meant to be more than you are now It's okay to dream and believe You're standing up straight, you notice the knots You're finally beating the odds Now don't let your own mind fool you You're just the way you've been raised Don't take that oath of guilt upon you Just look inside and you'll be amazed Where you feel like you were born on the bottom You won't quit till you're on the top You're standing up straight You notice the knots You're finally beating the odds Like the tune you've been playing They see you as wearing a crown Well, we've all had to climb our own mountain To feel our face warmed by the sun Just be the real you, no need for facades You're finally beating the odds You're finally beating the odds Absolutely gorgeous tune. Absolutely love it. So now I'm going to dive in. I'm going to do what I do best and, and 
nitpick and, and pull and prod and get all the information so that I can steal your mind and do my own thing. But <laughs> I love no. it. Yeah. I love so it. So what, when you were writing that, first off, is it lyrics that come first? Is it music that comes first? Is it both? Sometimes you, you, you find it, but when with that particular tune, let me ask this, let me kind of gather my thoughts. I'm really excited here. Um, <laughs> when you sat down to write that song, what did it look like from a, a compositional and songwriter lyrical standpoint? What was the process like? Did you find the tagline first? Did you have the chord progression and the feel first of the chords? What was the... I have been taught by my mentor to get on a writing schedule. You practice the guitar, don't you? Of course I do. Why aren't you practicing your songwriting? Why aren't you practicing yeah. your writing? So I had a morning ritual three mornings a week that the first thing I did when I woke up was right and I couldn't write for any less than 30 minutes so that was a big change for me because I was an in the moment guy okay and uh, and I've always written that way and I thought I writ some wrote excuse me some fairly good tunes that way mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was taught that uh, You'll write much better tunes if you become a writer. A writer writes. Yep. So write. Yep. Oh, yeah. So lyrics have been coming first. Okay. And that was different. That's different for you. Okay. So That's you, different. So your natural inclination is to write the music first. Oh, you know, I would go over to John's and we would lay down grooves and I would start singing. That's awesome. <laughs> that's like that's like flow, right? They call that flow. Yeah. I guess, I guess now it's a popular approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I used to do things like that, you know. And uh, but in this quest to write a better song, a better message, a a song that's easier to communicate to to people, I started writing. So so the lyrics came first. And another thing that I was taught was that, uh, and again, this is a change because right out of my mouth, right off the top of my head, that's the real thing, that's it. It's that way with lyrics, it's that way with guitar solos, you know. I'm not doing that overdub, editing, try it again. First thing comes off, man, that's the real thing. Okay. You know, All if right. it worked for Dwayne Allman, on live at Fillmore. It works for, for Eric Lambert at Beat the Odds. <laughs> so I, I, I used to think that way. And, and, and I learned that in writing, the first draft is indeed the first draft. And then we can talk about the direction of the song, the meaning of the song. Did you convey as clearly as you can. Um, when it feels like, when it feels like the whole world's against you and it's hard to get out of the bed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> See, I can't even remember the words to my song without playing. It's like the whole world's again, hard to get out of the bed. You feel like your insides are empty and the voices, they scream in your head. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's draft number three. That's so in, in, like interesting to me. That's awesome. I love that. But I think what we arrived at was something that was pretty clear. Um, went in one direction. Didn't jump around. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I can do. And... Uh, and then we agreed, okay. You know, I would send these lyrics off. They would be critiqued and come back to me and I would look at the suggestions and then I would write some more, you know. And as far as the music is concerned, 
you know, you and I have already spoken a lot today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On spiritual connection and being in touch with source, universe. You said the word God. Mm -hmm. Whatever name you want to apply to it, just get in touch with it. Mm -hmm. And let that flow come through you and out. I heard that song in my head in the shower, running lyrics in the shower. So was the idea of was the idea of what the song was about first, or was it you had just the, the feel and the uh, let me be more specific. I guess like finding finding the the meaning of it was was first sorry about that <laughs> i thought that was off but uh, was the meaning of it first or was it uh, i lost what i was saying now uh was the meaning of the song already going into it there or was it like you were painting a picture and finding out what it was about then pulling it over? i think uh, that's my what i'm both, trying to ask both we okay. had there was a goal okay there was there was a, a starting spot gotcha i wrote this song early on when uh when we were all uns unsure and we were in the house. So March to like June. Yeah. And, and, and there's this other part of my life about no longer being dependent on drugs and alcohol. There's another part of my life about um, spending time in Miller and looking around at a town that Miller and Gary, mm -hmm. and looking around at a town that, that obviously has more than its share of poverty. And a lot of things happened this last year, man. <laughs> and I don't oh, want to get, yeah. I don't want to get too much on a pedestal, but yeah, it dawned on me that and I've been so fortunate to do music and never had to turn back, never had to live in a box, never went more than a few days hungry. You can achieve anything you want despite where you come from. Now, you know, I didn't come from that far down. Mm -hmm. Some people do. Yeah. But those people can accomplish also. This is a song that was written to communicate with people. Don't buy the words they're saying. They want you to stay on the ground. Yeah. Some like the tunes you've been playing. Mm -hmm. They see you as wearing a crown. Mm -hmm. that, that's meant for everybody. All walks of life, shapes, colors, religions, no religion, whatever. Yeah. We're all people, human beings. Everyone deserves their bliss. Everyone deserves to live their dream. And you can if you don't buy in to that negative rhetoric that tells you you can't. That, w that was the goal of the song. And uh, with I, any uh, luck at all, it'll touch somebody. It, I, it, well, it, it already has. It already has. You know, because music is like for me, and it sounds like you as well. And I would, I would probably not be stretching too far to feel this way. But it's, it's. Um, people call it destiny or whatever. But I, I, I like the word. Use the word purpose. You know, we're all here for a purpose, and music, to me, is just the tool to allow people to heal. And to allow people to come together, and to, it's like kind of like um, it's like this little this little thing that you can put everybody in this box, and and every but it, the box constantly is ever growing because it's bringing everybody together if we allow it to, if the tool is being used in the right way, and I think that it's important that we remember that as songwriters, but also as like the listener, if they're listening, they they should listen with that intentful ear. To see what the real purpose of that song is, 
Is it about bringing people together or is it about bringing people apart? And I think for myself speaking, if, if you're listening intently to lyrics like this, if you're listening intently to what the song is about and you understand the purpose behind it, you can flow so much better and surround yourself and have so much better of a life if you're learning the lessons that are be, being given to you. It's not me speaking to the crowd or you speaking to the crowd. Like you said, you're merely just a vessel. You're just a vessel listening to something that is being conveyed. And we're just here to kind of fine tune that vessel, you know? Absolutely. I like to say that I wrote that song, and I think that's just a habit, programming, yeah, whatever. I was the vessel that that song flowed through mm -hmm. and, and came out eventually at Thunderclap Recording and was printed. I didn't write it. I didn't play it. I've simply become more connected with source so that source can flow those beautiful thoughts and messages through me. And I lack more and more every day resistance. And, and, and that's the goal, man, to be resistant free mm -hmm. and let that stuff flow from source right through me, out the instrument, onto, uh, you know, I, I almost said onto tape, <laughs> onto, onto hard drive. We love you, John, but I know you ain't doing <laughs> tape over there just like we ain't doing tape over here. I'll tell you what, John and I have done tape. I know he has. I've, I, when I was back there the, uh, back in the day when we were doing our very first Caught on Klein uh, in 2014, I think it was, uh, record. <laughs> I went in the back and I was like, I was like, hey John, you mind if I just like mosey around back here? Because he was like totally calm. He's like, yeah, go ahead. So I'm just like looking at all. I'm like, you got tape? You got this? You got old this that? He's like, yeah, I don't really use it anymore. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's got that section in his studio that's um, a museum. Oh, it's awesome, man. Full of cool stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I can't wait. I haven't seen him since the pandemic. I, you know closed down and we had to kind of do things uh i want to say virtually but from at a distance you digitally know, digitally yeah, yeah. It just it was it was really a interesting time so at any rate um this next tune so let's get into this next tune so i always ask this question is there like a music music is is our is a very spiritual thing for you and i and, and we can connect on that. So I'm going to ask you this question in this way. Do you, like, people go to church to pray, right? People go to the the woods to just experience nature and feel it. People go to all kinds of different buildings or places. Do you have a place that you write? Is there a consistent place? No. Okay. So this no. is new. This I want to hear about this. So what is it? what does that place look like for you? And it doesn't have to be a physical place. It can also be a maybe rituals that you do, like certain breathing patterns or uh, lighting a candle or, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody has a, a process. What does that process look for you and what does that place look like for you? Well, it requires meditation. What does meditation look like for you? That's very different for many different people. Oh, meditation for me is quiet. It's a very serene place. It takes a minute, but it's very still. The voices, they scream in your head. It, it takes me a minute to, to get all of them to quiet down. And then I see a big star <laughs> and I see energy emanating from that star and I breathe and I'll do that for 15 minutes or so and it sometimes may take a little bit longer to quiet everything down. So you can... It's Focus such a, on nothing. Such a busy dang world, you know? Yeah. And 
if allowed, squirrel cage, you know, mm -hmm. wheels are turning all the time. Oh, I got squirrel brain all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. All day, every day. So it actually takes a little bit of effort to slow everything down and quiet everything down. But once I can, and I always can, it just takes a little bit of effort, then I feel connected. And then, and it doesn't matter if I'm sitting on your couch, if I'm in the back seat of that one of those old Ford Econolines that <laughs> everybody uses to drive. We went back and forth across <laughs> yeah. the country in. Or in my bunk in the nice 40-foot tour bus in Tennessee, whatever. Or even in a green room. Even backstage. Even in the midst of chaos. I can find that place and I can write. How many years have you been practicing meditation? Oh gosh, a long time. Because I just began... Breathing meditation is what I consider it to be for myself. Um, five years now? Five years now? And it's just been... Truly, it saved my life. I'm not, I'm not going to even... I'm not, you know, like, I'll say it on camera. I don't care. It saved my life. It allowed me the time to clear my head. Yeah. Because there's just so much. And that's, you know, I'm guilty of thinking about things too much in that regard and it just allowed me to clear my head you know music is another form of meditation for me it takes me into a place and a time where i can really focus on just that you know mm -hmm. people ask me about pictures occasionally they see the look on my face while i'm playing and they say what are you thinking about i think about anything i'm totally connected I see my star. Mm -hmm. I see the energy coming off it. I'm not even in, in control of my body. What you're hearing, what you're seeing is spirit-led. And that's probably... Well, you know, I, I don't want to talk a lot about this, but, you know, <clears throat> part of freeing oneself from the dependence of drugs and alcohol required meditation and i started as a baby yeah you know and i i learned how to crawl and how to walk and how to run and uh, it's it's an all-day everyday thing mm -hmm. you know it doesn't just happen in the morning anymore and doesn't just happen before trying to write or trying to, before you go on stage. It's an all day, every day thing mm -hmm. for me. And that's been going on for 25 or 30 years. Off and on. Off and on, yeah. yeah. You know. We're, we're human. Until I, until I was able to get up and stand on my own two feet. And, mm hmm and begin to exercise it a lot more seriously. And then, uh, have you ever done something, say, in the studio or even on stage where something had been recorded, videotaped, whatever? You, try, you, to hear, play, you try to play exact the same thing? or <laughs> No, no. Oh, okay, actually, sorry. actually, the opposite. You hear, your, you hear yourself play something, and you say... Never played that before. <laughs> oh yeah. Where the oh, yeah. heck did that come yeah. from? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And You're those like, are what those... did I do there? You sit here. You try to. And you try to you figure it out. You try to figure it out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those are cool moments, man. And that spirit playing those parts. At least I believe so. Mm-hmm. It wasn't of my <laughs> thought or ability or. Because I've just played something beyond my ability. Yeah. And way cooler than I ever thought of. So that's, that's the stuff I really love. That's awesome. Yeah. So this next tune, then, um, you use this process of meditation for all your tunes, then you would say? Well, I would like to say that it's for the tunes, but uh, it's a daily thing. Okay. 
So I do want to make sure that my mind is right so before a writing session. Mm -hmm. So it's it's almost like an athlete for those that are like not maybe musically inclined. It's like an athlete stretching and doing calisthenics and getting mm. their body ready for the performance. You know? Absolutely. We warm up on the guitar. Yep. We warm our voices up. Mm -hmm. I got to get this thing in line too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you've, you've experienced all the senses of the day or all the senses of the week or a stressful time, you know, on the way to the gig because you back up in traffic and all these external factors. That, but now you're still expected to be right there, just like you were there for such and such and such and such that they liked you and they wanted to have you here. You have to be right there for that. Too. Yeah, and you got to be on, man. Yeah. You got to be on it. And sometimes, of course, there's the radio station um, visit mm -hmm. in the afternoon. And then sound check, load in, yeah, and all of that. And I, I have to have my mind right. I have to have my mind. I right. I very much respect that. Well, thank you, but it, it's. I'm 64 years old now. It's been a long, long road, man, <laughs> of learning how to take care of myself and learning how to get the best of myself. You know, daily inventory can, can give you information that you just have to act on. Ooh, don't, don't like that, don't like that. Oh, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no. And, and it gives you things to work on. It gives you goals and it gives you things about you and yourself and the way you communicate and the way you treat people and the way you think, ways to improve, things to improve on. And accepting that I'll never be perfect and that I'm not a failure because something I did was not perfect is a big door opening up and now I can just work towards that goal to get as close to that as I can. Because most, you know, don't sweat the small things. Most things are small things. Yeah. Most things are small things, man. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, heard a parable once uh, about like you want to go to the beach, but then you get upset at the one grain of sand that goes into your eye and you can't see the beach. You know, but you could still feel the beach. You could still breathe the beach. You could feel, you know, you could feel it, but you're so concerned about the one grain of sand that went in your eye. Yeah, yeah. Missing all the beauty mm -hmm. and worrying about a, a, a single inconvenience or... Well, you know, it's, it's, you're worried about yourself. Yeah. And you can't see the beauty, that source, spirit, universe, mm -hmm. God, Allah, has presented right in front of you. No doubt about it. And there's well, beauty, beauty, beauty everywhere. There, there, I was just going to say, there, well, there's beauty everywhere. So as long as you don't got the greatest sand in your eye, you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear this tune. So what's the one, what's this one called? This one's called The Music Set Me Free. I was standing alone in a crowded room. Everyone was speaking their mind. Invisible though, they didn't have a clue about the me I was gonna find. I sat down with a friend, he was playing guitar Showed me the chords to his tune The clouds split wide open, I found my voice A bright light took over the room I'm in love with the world when I play the guitar It's the best version of me 
Not a care or a worry, not a wound or a scar. The music set me free. The music it set me free. The guitar was my ticket out of the old neighborhood. The steel mills and running the streets to stages and places I'd never have known. If I hadn't followed my dreams, I'm in love with the world when I play the guitar. It's the best version of me. Not a care or a worry, not a wound or a scar. The music set me free. The music it set me free. So I still have my fair share of problems I can still hurt and blue I can be But it gave me the courage to forge my own way Live joyous and happy and free I'm in love with the world when I play the guitar It's the best version of me Not a care or a worry, not a wound or a scar The music set me free it set me free Beautiful tune mm, And you. I can definitely sympathize Not empathize with that one <laughs> um, When was that written? That might have been written about a year ago Okay Something like that it's got a little bit of a backstory. I was uh, I was actually out on the road and visiting people in their homes and giving guitar lessons. And uh, I had a phone meeting with Nashville, so I was sitting in the in the Mustang. And I say the Mustang because there's a backstory there too. If it don't fit in the Mustang, it don't go. But okay. um, so I sat in the Mustang and had my phone meeting and wrote about three quarters of the tune during that meeting in the car in the parking lot at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. It, and it was just one of those locked in occasions. And, uh, and it's really, really pretty much a true story. It's my story. Very cool. You know, when you're standing in a party and everybody's whipping it up and doing their thing and 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 all of that group is there and you're standing here, you know, because you just got other things going on in your mind. Mm-hmm. That's where or, it all or the, For me, it's that. There's three aspects to it. And when I heard that tune, from, from my perspective, there's three aspects to it. There's what you just mentioned, and there's also the, the things that are going on around me are not me. Which, f f I, I, like being, being very transparent, I would say it's probably 90, 95% of the time in the situations I'm in are not me. You know, and so I tried to take that over the last few years from 100 percent of the time <laughs> to let's go down to 99, let's go down to 98, yeah, and and keep bringing it to where it is more you. You know, I'm a, you know, I might I might get out there and dance and get people on the dance floor and have fun and do all these wild things on stage, but I love this. I love this. This is what. You know, I my whole purpose of this show and having Region Buzz as a studio was to create a literal space for original music to start to begin to try to thrive in some element, in some way and fashion for Northwest Indiana. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, we should shout out to Front Porch Music. Yes, absolutely. Once their concert season resumes we'll start yeah starts getting back on it that's where you can they welcome you and you can play original music there mm -hmm. to a sit-down audience yep that will actually listen 
<laughs> well, yeah, and it's, it's and there's uh, snacks. There's always snacks. <laughs> there's great snacks. The lovely Jane is behind the the snack bar, and and God bless her and Paul for starting front porch music back in the day. Yeah, and and thank goodness for Chad to pick it up and. Shout out to Chad. Keep it thriving. Great yeah. songwriter. I've yeah. been wanting to get him on here, but his he's probably one of the busiest guys I know. Mm-hmm. You know, gigging and everything. But um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, th- those are like the, th- when I heard it, that, you know, just heard that for the first time, that's what I kind of thought to myself was like, I can sympathize, but I can, I also have just this my very own personal in- interpretation to it. So, that leads me to my next question about the next song and kind of touching on this one as well is do you write with the intent for um, it being first person, third person often? And then do you write it sometimes vague enough to where it's open for interpretation or is it just based upon this, this song is this, this song is that like, you know, do you have like an over overwhelming I'm sorry, an over, overcasting um, style of like, okay, I want to write this way and this is like my sound and my approach. Or are you really just pushing those boundaries constantly to just be about the song? I'm trying to do as little as possible. I'm trying to be open and willing for whatever is going to come through to allow it to. Okay. That song was first person. I've written others like uh, Found Out My Daddy Was Wrong or The Dirt in the Cigarettes, who was uh, not, I don't know the proper English terminology. Was it second person? You know, <laughs> I, I wrote it from the perspective of another person telling the story and not about me, it but about them. Yeah, yeah. But all I did was jot the words down and put the music to it to tell their story. So, you know, uh, there's not that much of a thought process on on my part. I just write it and see where it comes from, see what, how we can shape it, mm-hmm. what John and I can do with it at the studio. Gotcha. And the first step is usually call Donnie. <laughs> you know, call Sternberg to bring to come in on mandolin. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Kyle O'Brien, who played fiddle on the new recording. Ooh, I'm excited to hear that. Oh. We brought now Kyle has relocated from Chicago back to his his home state of Colorado. But uh we brought Kyle in for I do believe two specific tunes. And his stuff flows so much like water that we were done in 30 minutes. And he said, well, do you have anything else? And we just started running tracks. And he just played. Some of it that we printed and some of it that we didn't, but we probably kept 70% of what he played on stuff that we had no intention of putting fiddle on. Isn't that crazy? Oh, boy, he was so, so connected that day. Yeah. And then, uh, then of course, the lovely Char came in and sang all the harmony voices. Not all of them, like, overdubbed. Mm-hmm. Mostly, like, in duet form, her and I just singing. Yeah. Like we do like we do when we perform. Now, do you do the old school like bluegrass thing where everybody's on one mic when you record at John's or do you guys kind of have everything individually mic'd out and We have everything mic'd out. Okay. Cuz I know that some people are like so infatuated with that perspective that they want even their audio recordings in that way. And I was I didn't think that you did it that way. We don't do it that way. Okay. I have done it that way and and I love that. Yeah. And sometimes we perform that way. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have individual mics. But um, in the studio, we were singing. We had, you know, he's 
as you're aware, he has two performance yep. rooms. Yep, he's got the kind of the drum the room, in so to speak, it. and then the the main live room. And and we would sing room to room, yeah. eye to eye, on a lot of things. And of course, Donnie and I would do the same thing, trading solos, mm-hmm. just looking eye to eye. Um, that's the kind of stuff I don't want to change change too much or mess around with too yeah. much, because. Uh, that's that's where some real things can happen. But I also wanted to give out um, uh, a shout out to Terry Boylan, who came in and played drums on three tracks for us. And of course, there are there are drum owners, and there are drummers. And Terry Boylan is most certainly one of the drummers. <laughs> what a what a great musician he is. Yeah. John Carpenter, of course, mixed mastered. And sang, really on the record. Oh, there are no. two tracks. There are two tracks. One of them beating the odds. The other one, uh, the wait, at the uh, at the behest of of Nashville, we recorded the wait for radio promotion. But uh, we had three voices on that track also, and John. Did the third part, and <clears throat> wonderfully and beautifully, you know. John actually, there was a part where, um, I couldn't make the studio, and Alex and Caught on Klein could not make the studio, and and just Nick J, the bass player, was there. But Nick J doesn't know how to play mandolin at all. Like, and, but there was a there's a couple notes in one of the mandolin parts, in one of our songs, that were incorrect. So, <clears throat> John Carpenter went in. Played the three notes that we needed, and <laughs> and so we always laughed that John was on our album. You know, <laughs> whether I mean, he was always on our album, right? Because producer well, sure. and an engineer is is just as important um, to capture that sound and have their creative outlook. But he was literally on our album playing mandolin for like three notes. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, you bring up a. a extremely important and valid point I was on the recording Donnie was on the recording Kyle Terry Shar John and John probably carried more weight than any of us with with the multi-hat performance that he can provide he did the graphics for the CD as well Really? That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, he records it and records it beautifully. He mixes and mixes beautifully. He master his mastering has taken phew. I um so I've heard. His mastering is becoming he's like finding that that uh that niche, you know what I mean? Like that like this is what he does, so to speak. I mean, he don't get me wrong. He produces, mixes, engineers everything, but yeah, mastering is an entirely, entirely different animal. He had the unfortunate occurrence to have some equipment go down. That was my last conversation with him when we were talking. Yeah, and he decided to upgrade some of it rather than. Oh, I don't know. If he decided not to fix it or whatever, but he did upgrade some gear. Yeah, and uh, and he's uh, his mastering man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, that's good to know. Yeah, that's good to know. Well, you know, the recording that I'm looking for is a group of master players on high quality hand-built acoustic instruments and to have a person of such amazing ability as John Carpenter translate that sound onto a medium. Um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. That's not easy. No. I'm not looking for an effect. I'm not looking for Anything except pure, pure tone mm-hmm. from this guitar and the three or four others that I played, and Donnie's amazing, you know, handmade mandolins, yeah. and Kyle's 200-year-old fiddle, and, and Terry 
playing the drums like a musical instrument on a purely acoustic recording. Mm -hmm. Translating those tones and those feelings and, and those emotions. That's, that's a trick, man. It is. And, and the other thing <clears throat> is, you know, here at like Region Buzz, we do things pretty digitally. You know, we do a lot of digital projects for people. Um, and we can do it that same way. But the way music is moving, John is like a, a platinum diamond that knows how to take that old, like, I don't want to say old sound, but that old approach, that old approach, and does it really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I tell people that all the time. I'm like... If you want that kind of sound, you don't, you don't, like you can come here and we'll, we'll get it as best we can get it and it'll sound great. But if you want someone who's been doing that forever, go down the road to Thunderclap. I have no problem making, you know, making people connections for John and, and allowing him to get a client that might be better suited for him than me. You know what I mean? And that's, I try to tell people that all the time, like, when you come to our studio, this is our process. When you go to John, that's his process. Don't try to manipulate someone's process just because you want to do something different. You know, like do what you do and find the place that you can do that in. Yeah. You, you need to be comfortable. You have to you be comfortable. You need to have a good working relationship mm -hmm. with a producer slash engineer, people at the facility. And I can tell you, it was, I was highly encouraged and it was suggested that I make the trip to Nashville to do this record. And I said, well, let's try it my way first. And John has recorded and mixed and mastered a beautiful recording of beautiful acoustic guitars and mandolins and fiddles and voices. And when I listened to that master, I got the hair stood up, you know. Oh, yeah. Because, now I forgot who, who said this, but I just read this recently. Oh, and I was reading about some of the products, uh, Dangerous Audio, that, that John is now using. And, and the, the description was, if you can't hear it, you can't mix it. You know, simply meeting, if, if it's not clear, if it doesn't come through... Mm -hmm. You know those old recordings? They get digitally remastered and you think, I never heard that before. <laughs> and it's, it's as slight as like the guy's fingernail hitting the guitar. You know, you're sure. like, what the hell was that? Where did sure. that come from? And John and I keep that stuff in. Yeah. Squeaks on the strings. Mm -hmm. Donnie's shifting his weight in the chair. Mm -hmm. It's digital and it's pristine and clean and... but. We still have to keep some of that realness. And some people want it. And, and some, some people, people don't. absolutely don't. You know? I have a habit of doing that sometimes. Uh huh. I mean, I'll strum and. Yep. I've been in sessions where people say, either you got to stop that or you have to remove it. You know? But uh, we, we still like some of that stuff. Yeah. But I can hear the instruments. They're beautiful. They're crisp. They have depth. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He's doing a wonderful job. He's he's great. He's absolutely great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our next project with Coc being able to be in the studio with him. We were like recording here and having to send stuff, and I was like, you know, it was just like, you know what? Let's just try this once, see if we like it. But when we get back to our normal thing, past COVID, post -co post COVID rather then we can kind of get where we need to be back with John and have that yeah. real, that real, uh, I, 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 you know, cause I'm producing, mixing, mastering everything and writing the songs and performing them. It's exhausting. Sure. It's exhausting. <laughs> sure. Know? And, and, you know, I, I used to try to wear those hats also, and I never quite understood what the influence of other people really had to do what I already heard in my head. Yeah. Except it has a lot it has to a do lot. with it. 
Oh, yeah. And I could never in a million years contribute to this project what Kyle or Donnie or Terry did or Shar simply because I, it's not it, I don't have their perspective you don't you, and you haven't had their exact experiences that have allowed them to be the human being that they are to grow to be who they are yeah, yeah. oh yeah and it, it it took me some years to understand that and it's it's that gumbo, you know, that Wynton mm -hmm. Marsalis likes to talk about. Oh yeah, you gotta have all that stuff in there, man. Yeah, <laughs> and you gotta have that roux. You or gotta just have don't that taste that. that right. It just don't taste right. <laughs> yeah, and having John's influence and Sternberg's influence and Kyle O'Brien and and Terry and Shar mm -hmm. have finally created something that I'm really really happy with. Not only that I'm happy with, but that I think will communicate to others around the world. You know, I'm thinking worldly here. I'm not necessarily just thinking. Yeah. Neighborhood like, you mm -hmm. know. Absolutely. So, this next tune, what's it called? It's called Let's All Get in the Way. All right. I want to hear it before I hear anything about it. Okay. <laughs> Two, ready, play. Born a sharecropper's son in Alabama. Fought a nine mile and fight for mankind. Stood tall on the bridge there in Selma. Didn't back down from speaking his mind. Was arrested and beaten, rose up again, laid his life on the line to be free. He was there when colored people who won the right to vote, made good trouble for you and for me. John Lewis, an American hero, is alive in my memory today. Like a beacon, he's standing there saying, let's all get in the way. He was honored and elected to Congress, and he served there for 17 terms. He was awarded the Medal of Freedom, an award he so proudly had earned. He was a champion of nonviolent protest, a lesson he learned from Dr. King. He was admired by members of both parties. He implored them to do the right thing. John Lewis, an American hero, is alive in my memory today. Like a beacon, he's standing there saying, let's all get in the way. The people have suddenly awakened. We saw George Floyd get murdered in the street. A crime that's been going on for decades. Its acceptance is becoming obsolete. And the cities are alive with cries for justice. And awareness John taught us with love. The man was giant, strong as Goliath. Peaceful and gentle like a dove. John Lewis, an American hero, is alive in my memory today. Like a beacon, he's standing there saying, let's all get in the way. John Lewis, an American hero, is alive in my memory today. On a mountain, he's standing there saying, let's all get in the way. Let's all get in the way. John Lewis.
Well, now I know what that song's about. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, was that a pretty easy write? It sounded like it was a pretty easy write. Yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty easy write. Because I could tell that it was super <clears throat> sincere and you meant every single word of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I went to uh, I went to a Chicago public school and then I went to a Chicago Chicago parochial high school. And it wasn't until <clears throat> later in life that I even began to become aware of what I just wrote about. That's very interesting. I don't believe I was taught that in school. I did not pay much attention in school, granted. <laughs> but I don't believe I was, I was taught too much about that. And uh, a few years back, I was invited to join a stage production called Oh Freedom. Oh Freedom, Songs of the Civil Rights Movement. My friend Chris Valillo down in central Illinois put this together and we played a, a series of theaters and uh, the Lincoln Public Library okay. <coughs> in Springfield. <clears throat> and it was an amazing production and it, and it moved me. And uh, I tell you what, when you're on stage and you're playing and singing with a 30 or 40 piece choir singing We Shall Overcome, Talk about goosebumps you just had a lot earlier. Oh. Yeah, that just took me there right away. Ooh. And uh, and when John Lewis passed away, that was... Uh, was that all around the same time as the concert? No, no, no. John Lewis passed oh, okay. away so, okay, okay. during the pandemic, oh, early yeah, on. Okay, so this was... this concert was many, many... This was a few years oh, back. Okay, okay. That was... I got that mixed up. Gotcha. Thankfully... Post uh, pandemic, I got a call to, to go do that show again. Wonderful. But um, yeah, that right was a no-brainer. That right was easy. That that right was sitting there waiting. It's built upon the values of what your music seems to be all about and your purpose. You know, connecting and bringing people together. Thank you, thank you, and. Uh, I can I consider John Lewis an American hero, and I felt the need to to say that. You know, we did the songwriting thing with Tom Lounge. Is mm -hmm. another shout out yep. to uh, a mentor and friend and supporter to all of us. Mm -hmm. When Tom uh, did the fundraiser, and we had a songwriter panel, and we all performed, and. Uh, Boy, oh boy, I was just going to say something, and I, and I forgot it. <laughs> you, uh, you, we were talking about the uh, about John Lewis being an American hero, and then you went into the songwriter panel. Um, Someone from the audience asked, you know, they were asking us questions about songwriting, and, and one of my responses was, uh, it's my voice. It's my voice. It's my opportunity to say what I want to say. It's my podium. It's, it's, it's what allows me to share what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And, and, and that song is uh, exactly what I was thinking and feeling when I wrote it. And I still think and feel that way as you and I are talking about it now. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And it's something that will be, you know, people talk about timeless music. Even though that is a historical piece, it, 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 at some point it's going to become a historical piece, right? Because right now it, we're, we're living through that historical time. And it's going to be a historical piece. And I think that that's something that's really um, important as a songwriter. Not to get too off topic, but... As songwriters, we're kind of like just these, there's a there's point A and there's point B, right? And But that's just our point A and point B, the beginning and the end of our life. But 
in the grand scheme of humankind, in the grand scheme of what musicians and songwriters for eras and eras and eras have been doing is to bring people together, right? And our purpose and our gift and our voice, as you said, is from part A to part B is to carry that vessel. You're just that little chug boat carrying that same message to the next A to B. So there's there's a bit of uh, generational wealth, so to speak, <laughs> from coming from some of from some of that. So I want to I just want to say thank you for allowing yourself to be that vessel and be able to do that. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity to share that. Absolutely, that's what this is for. You know, I, we might not be the biggest channel out there or anything like that, but I don't really care about that. I mean, of course, you want people to listen. And you want people to experience what we're talking about. But um, I wanted to create that space for original music and let young songwriters have some of these perspectives. You have a very different perspective than some of my other you know, artists where it's like, oh, I just write for me. I just write 100% for myself. I don't care if anybody listens to it. I, I To me, it was like, what? <laughs> you know? But... There, there's a, it's, it's very interesting to me just to hear how songwriters look at what they're doing and what does it mean, you know? Is it, is it strictly for the business? Is it stri strictly for making a living? Is it just a complete passion? Is it a purpose? And I just wanted this little idea of having this show and being able to just talk to cool people. <laughs> you know, like yeah, that's what this is. It's just sitting out and talking to cool people. So again, thank you for allowing yourself to be that vessel. Thank you for allowing yourself to be able to share your life with other people. Thank you, my friend. So thank you for what you do and uh, continue doing it, man. I thoroughly enjoyed your performance when I saw you play solo. Thank you. You're uh, you're a master musician and vocalist, and uh, great at what you do. You're great at this. Yeah, you think so? You're I'm a very natural new at this. born interviewing type <laughs> cat, is what you okay. are. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's cool. That's good to know coming from coming from you. Yeah. And and I know for a fact this isn't an easy do. No, it's not. And and a shout Keep out to the team Keep this place here. up and run in and open. <clears throat> Being up and ready to go Saturday morning, yeah, 11 a.m. hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't a this, this isn't, isn't the this easiest is not thing easy. To do. No, it's definitely not easy. Um, but you know, because of the reason we continue to try to do this is because of the viewers, and 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 also, you know, shout out to my guys Ben, Chase, Nigel, all the guys that work here. We have Aiden comes and helps sometimes. These are all part of that that moving space to allow them to grow as engineers, uh, videographers, photographers, you know, that sort of thing. It, it's bringing people together. It's that community so that we can all have that. What you you used the word bliss earlier. We can all have that bliss. We can all have that that opportunity. Everyone deserves their bliss. Yeah. No so, doubt about it. So we'll take the last segment here a little bit to just talk a little bit about when's the album coming out, where they're going to find it, that sort of thing. Um, is it going to be digital platforms? Is it going to be strictly just CDs? Where can they find those? What's the what's the, what's that look like for you? The plan, as much as I can plan, is that uh, both formats will be available. Okay. And, and the reason I'm running CDs primarily is because radio promotion, um, for the most part, is still looking for CDs. Yes. I'm, I'm, my niche these days is, is a, an acoustic niche, a folk slash Americana niche, and... Uh, not only do the DJs like the CDs, 
and liner notes with lyrics. They're into the lyrics, and they want to see them and read them and so on and so forth. So there will be some, some CD product available. Um, after years and years and years of using CD Baby, I'm going to distribute through Bandcamp. Um, I mentioned Don Sternberg many times this hour. Don has an amazing new product out. He's, he's one of the premier jazz mandolinists in the world. So he has a product on Bandcamp. So I went to get it, um, A, out of respect, B, because I love his music, yeah, and C, because I wanted uh, the experience of working with Bandcamp as a consumer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was easy. It was easy to find the product I was looking for. It was easy to download it. It was easy to pay for it. Digital and hard copy were available. I chose digital. <clears throat> so we'll be working there. Cool. CD Baby will distribute it to Amazon, Apple, and Spotify. You know, the thing that those. they do. Yeah, yeah. That digital distribution that they do so well. And uh, there'll be a link on my website, of course, taking you to Bandcamp. I won't sell it from my website. And, uh, of course, it'll be at shows, and uh, the local show will be September 25th. Where at? At Tom Lounge's Record Bin in Michigan, Michigan City. City. Okay, okay. <clears throat> now, that is, a, that is a Sunday, is it not? I believe it's a Saturday. It may be a Saturday. Okay, I thought the 24th was a Saturday. I, I, I know it's a Saturday, so I may have misquoted the date. Okay. But it is that twenty, the fourth or twenty fourth or twenty fifth or twenty third, one of those. Yeah, yeah. For, I I'm playing a festival that weekend, and I know that it's. I was like, am I playing Friday night or am I playing Saturday? Night? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. couldn't remember. <laughs> so. And you know, more details that come out about that. We're not quite sure of the lineup and okay, and different things. But uh, we'll have a local release over there, and of course, when uh, when front porch resumes a, a concert schedule of course I'll, I'll i'll go to chat and see if we can do something over there nice but uh it'll 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 be it'll be fun to to get some response. so september september will be the official local yeah the official local release yeah. and um carrie does a fabulous job with radio promotion and uh, I'll have some print promotion going on as well. And it'll be fun. It'll be fun. It'll be beautiful. And it'll be another experience to put in the, uh, in the memory bank. It will. It will. And it will be enjoyable. It hasn't always been enjoyable. <laughs> you know, that perfection thing. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Trust oh, me. Oh, my God. It's not selling enough. And... That guy didn't play me yet, and, you know, the whole group of them can get mm -hmm. together. But uh, fortunately, that won't be the case this time. Yeah. Well, again, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. It was a blessing and a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience. And one last thing for the young songwriters at home, if there's one thing you can tell them, one, one overlapping thing that you can leave for the young songwriters, what would it be? Well, if you're a songwriter, write songs. Write songs. Don't wait for the spirit to move you. Don't wait for the the ah moment. Write songs. If you write a hundred songs, and twenty inch or twenty five of them are potentially good songs. And you're doing a good job. Write songs, man. Writers write. You heard it here from That's Eric right. Lambert. Thank you all so much for <laughs> thank you all so much for tuning in. It is Songwriter Sunday. I'm your weekly host, Nicholas Cazonis. We are going to be taking a short break after Eric's uh, and having a few in August, but then we're going to resume 
every week again, starting in September, once we get back to um, a little bit cooler weather and everybody's actually sitting at home watching. So hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care and God bless you. Be well.